can you hear me? Yes? Okay. This is one, one of the new things that the IGF is uh, learning how this system works and that we have to have headphones. Reminds me of these um, parties that are, that are without any sound in the, in, in the city where people are dancing using the, the headsets and listening to the same music. That's an amazing thing. You're watching 100 people dancing on the main square without any music around. They are listening to the same station and it's, it's amazing. Now this is a new concept on the IGF, but it's okay. Okay, so we are moving to the second part. We have a bit fewer people than, than on the first part, but probably they'll join us. Um, in this second part, we are going to discuss the, the IGF process. So at the beginning, we started with, the, with thinking about how the IGF basically can impact the, the, internet the internet policies and can it impact. It's a multi-stakeholder environment and so on. So one of the things we want to do at this session is to link the IGF with the other existing uh, government and international initiatives like the ITU, the ICANN, the OSCD, the G8, and many, many other uh, events. I will start with, the, with the, the recent updates or upgrades, at least recommended ones, of the IGF. So the UN uh, committee, the CSTD group, and we are lucky to have Peter with us who was vice chairing the CSTD, uh, came up with a number of recommendations so on how IGF should look like I guess so that it probably has more impact than it had thus far. I would say so, or I hope so. So Peter, um, what do you think that the IGF, how is it going, how is the IGF going to impact the internet policies in future? What are those changes or those key things that the CSTD working group recommended and that probably all of us that are participating in the IGF should be aware of? Well, it, it may sound a bit optimistic, but I, I, I still think that uh, all recommendations will have some impact. And uh, I came to this IGF with the idea of uh, engaging mostly MAG members to work on this issue. And I can only see the multi-stakeholder advisory group to, to uh, be active in implementing the recommendations which will serve the uh, real improvements to the IGFs uh, as far as uh, uh, the outreach of the IGF is concerned, the, the impact of the IGF is concerned, the legitimacy of the IGF is concerned, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I am convinced that IGF can have an impact since it's uh, closely related to the UN it has uh, legitimacy and uh, based on this legitimacy uh, most governments uh, could uh, accept uh, it provided the means and the tools we are going to use are uh, up to the standards up to the expectations and uh, during the discussion during the break we, we had a very interesting discussion about these uh, issues and there are some suggestions which will be brought up, I think, during the taking stock session, uh, how to go about. But uh, uh, as you may know, we had 39 recommendations in the, uh, uh, as a result of the working group. And uh, up to now, uh, not much has happened to, uh, as far as implementation is concerned. There were some uh, uh, ways, trials to improve the website of the IGF itself uh, with not much success as I can see it from now and uh, as I have been reminded uh, this is the entry point for many people to the IGF itself and once you enter the, the website uh, will you navigate on this website you may or you may not but uh, for those who don't navigate further uh, IGF they are lost for the IGF and we don't want that. So what we really want is to have uh, more and more people involved and from all stakeholders, uh, last but not least from government. 
and in case governments go to this website, they, they don't really feel like uh, going much further. So that, that, that is my, my idea. Yes, we have to implement these recommendations in order to improve. But having in mind that uh, even if we achieve to bring more and more people, and that's quite useful, we are getting more and more people, it's becoming more and more open process. We have a lot of experience with diplomacy as well, with the IT process. This is probably the first one that it's that is truly multi-stakeholder process that we can say that it's achieved in part of all, okay, high can that's a different type, but the first UN big process. But can we have a feeling, all of us that are here, not as governments, that we can impact in the future that someone else will pick up from this IGF and say, okay, this is the right policy. It was absolutely right that we discussed certain topics here because someone will hear it. Is it possible to, to change this, this UN system to some extent to get the, the best bits from the, from the IGF and, and make it useful? Uh, those of you, you who know me, uh, I, I am born optimist <laughs> and I, I'm convinced that uh, we can change. We can, we can change and I think we have already changed. Well, one of the good examples was the working group itself, which was a real multi-stakeholder uh, group. And uh, they, uh, I can tell you that, uh, uh, and uh, those of you who are, some of you were with me on, on, on this group can confirm that we worked in a very constructive manner. And we, uh, we didn't ask who is coming from where. So uh, we were on equal footing. Uh, and I'm convinced that eventually uh, what we have been talking about uh, uh, related to ex enhanced cooperation, this working group will come into being, which uh, to my mind will give uh, further uh, enforcement to the IGF process itself. And uh, the other part of this story is to have the governments involved in the IGF itself. So I'm not really sure that uh, uh, if they don't get directly involved, we can make the real difference. But once they are here and they, they can see it for themselves, then probably we can have a bigger impact. But they are, they are uh, uh, conditions to that, of course, and we have to fulfill these conditions. And uh, basically, uh, one of the things that they should know about IGF, and some of them don't even know about IGF, so we have to inc improve the outreach, uh, to send out invitations, to, to uh, I mean, we are not talking about uh, rocket science, so we, uh, there are small things, and these small things really make the difference. Thank you. Um, by the way, any one of you, if, at, if you want to jump in with question or comment at any point, let me know, I'll, I'll run around and bring the one and only microphone, but just raise a hand. And also for the panelists. And Bervi, uh, talking about the governments, um, you're there. But is it enough? And uh, are, are do we have enough governments? Are they, are they ready to listen to what's happening here? Um, are there other fora that, that they might be li listening to rather than, than here? Well, thank you, uh, Vlad, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Yes, from my point of view, I can say that the governments are here. Finland is here, at least. I come from the foreign ministry of uh, Finland, by the way. <laughs> um, but, um, and we listen. Um, I think IGF has a potential to make a huge impact. It's really the only forum where all stakeholders can participate at equal level. It's where all stakeholders have their voice and it's really unique in, in the UN system to have something like this. Um, and taking an example, I believe it was in Sharm El Sheikh when we conducted um, the consultations on the future of the IGF. And uh, there it was really um, most of, the, most of uh, those who uh, spoke were strongly supporting the future of the IGF and the mandate to be continued and that's what happened then um, the CSTD the Commission on Science and Technology made the decision which was approved in the ECOSOC um, I hope I'm not confusing you with all these details and then it was confirmed in in the General Assembly so so IGF can make a huge difference 
The other question is if governments participate, and that's where I have a concern, uh, which I believe is shared by many. We have a declining number of governments, unfortunately, and we have to think about ways uh, how to bring them in. And that's why we made recommendations in the CSDD working group on the improvements uh, of the IGF, how to bring more governments involved, especially from developing countries, how to support their participation, how to make sure that they are here and they listen, because if they are not here, then the impact is, of course, not that good. Um, on one hand, we, we want to get more and more of them, of the governments, of you, <laughs> of the governments. On the other hand, we keep talking about the, the equal footing and equal chance for everyone to talk. And on the third hand, we, or at least some of us, are frightened that the governments might take it too seriously and take over the internet, as there have been a lot of discussions recently about taking over the internet by the ITU, by the governments, and so on. So we have ISOC with us as well. Nicholas, um, as, as a representative of a technical and, and user community in a way, um, is, it, is, it, is it a real threat, and are we are we really on equal footing? Is IGF the only one? Are we even on equal footing here at the IGF and let alone about the other processes? Thanks. Um, <coughs> well, this is, this is a very good question. And um, I mean, you know, I, I guess the IGF is, I mean, definitely one of probably the purest form of multi-stakeholder participation. But uh, I mean, from my experience, uh, multi-stakeholder participation is really something that has various degrees. And you mentioned, do we participate in other uh, internet governance fora? And uh, well, yesterday there was uh, a pre-event about enhanced cooperation, which is one of the outcome of the, the WISIS uh, in Tunis. And you know, what does enhanced cooperation mean? And for us, uh, involvement in various internet governance processes, I mean, the IGF, of course, but other ones as well, is really part uh, of this, of this uh, process. And I think it's very important for us stakeholders to move out from our comfort zone, if you will, and to participate in you know, other intergovernmental processes. And also, on the other hand, for this fora to open up uh, their processes to, to other stakeholders. And um, uh, to, to that respect, I mean, ISOC has been since 2005, we've uh, tried to get, you know, observer status in various organizations at the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, we participate at the World Trade Organization. Uh, in 2009, we got an ECOSOC status to participate, for example, in the, in the Human Rights Council. So what does it mean to participate? What does it mean to participate? Okay, uh, that's interesting because actually, depending on the fora, it's, it's very different. So for example, uh, I, I can take two examples. Um, one is the OECD. Uh, in 2008, the, the OECD decided to open its uh, process to new stakeholders. So an internet technical advisory committee was created a civil society advisory committee was created. So basically we participate to the OECD and we can provide technical advice for the recommendations they create. And it's a really positive relationship because member states are happy to have this technical expertise. On the other hand, we are able to influence the, the policy outcomes. Another example is the, the Human Rights Council. Uh, ISOC has been participating at the Human Rights Council for about two years. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting fora because they have been increasingly taking into account human rights related issue, I mean, on uh, internet issues. Um, but still, I mean, the format of participation there is very limited for, for non-governmental stakeholders. I mean, I've had an experience to try having a two minute statement there and it's, uh, I mean, it's a very difficult process. So, I mean, you can have an influence. You can, th there is a lot of corridor diplomacy, uh, but the, you know, it, it's not a multi-stakeholder environment. So to respond to your question, I mean, 
it really depends on the fora. Um, some of them are very intergovernmental still with some opening to other stakeholders. Other, uh, like for example, the OECD have really since Tunis taken a, a bigger step uh, for, for other stakeholders to participate in these processes. So I, I think the example that, um, that uh, Peter uh, gave at the beginning that the CSTD working group, the group that was working within the UN system on the improvements, recommendations about the improvements of the IGF was a, a, a multi-stakeholder based. Um, and probably that's one of the questions if the IGF can also impact the other systems to change and accept multi-stakeholderism more. But then besides the, 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 the civil society, there is also, well, I don't know, Vim, if I can, if I can say that you're in a way business sector because many of the CCTLDs are also uh, in a way business, but usually non for profit, but let's say technical community, which is also involved, you feel, cons or you can feel, feel the consequences of IG policy decisions on local, regional, global level on your business or the, the way you're managing the, the resources. How do you see it? How, how can you impact the, the process? Um, well, basically at this, this moment, um, I don't think we see a lot of, of influence coming from internet governance, international internet governance debate um, so far. Um, but on the other hand, that's also one of the main reasons why we are here. Because like you said, we are like the more business and even more technical community, uh, the national CCTLDs. And one of the, the reasons we come here, we are here at the IGF to have a workshop is to show and to have contact with uh, also the political level and to say, have a look and try to understand us. Let us explain what we are doing, how we are organized. And before you come up and before you um, start to, to, to come up with ideas or, or try to implement some new uh, internet government's um, principles, first um, come and understand how the system is working, how we organize ourselves. Because that's something, if I go back to, I mean, I, I'm one of the lucky people that was at the first IGF and all the others in between. Um, I found it a little bit also in this discussion, uh, we are moving a little bit towards, okay, how can we get the internet governance um, into the international debate, into the political debate? How can we get to the IGF, um, change the IGF, so to, to have a bigger impact there? One thing that I think is a little bit, m has a little bit moved to the back um, at this moment, and what was more prominent in the beginning is we are come we also come here to exchange our best practice to let the others see how we organize ourselves how we as a for example as a cctld community explain to the other communities how we are organizing how the system is working because don't forget uh, internet governance is something that um, came under in the spotlight for the last couple of years but before that the internet was growing uh, and that's I think also in even before um, new big debates on internet governance come to an end and come with um, with a solution or try to arrange things or regulate things, we try to be there and we should be there to explain and say, okay, but this is how it works today and this is how we build the system uh, to a system that's uh, that's working. Um, one, just to, to make a clear practical example, we always uh, we always give, but. Uh, not an internet, it's really at the local level, is when the local police comes to knock at uh, one of the CCTLD registers' doors, say, okay, there is a problem with that domain name, you have to uh, take it off uh, offline at this moment. Um, this, uh, our members always say, okay, and the police comes and they really play the policeman and come to threaten you and say, okay, and if you don't do that, we will shut down this and this and this service and whatever. And they say, then we start to talk and then we start to explain to them, well, they say, okay, if we take away the name, nothing will change, nothing will happen. I mean, the content will still be accessible. If uh, the content is hosted outside the country, they will just create a new domain name. If you look up, there are uh, a lot of systems to circumvent that. And they say, okay, now that you understand it, let's go and sit together, you from the, uh, well, it's usually the police, uh, we from the, the technical community, and let's discuss how, from our experience, how we can we um, work to a solution. And there are examples of countries where uh, the police say, okay, we know we won't come to threaten you 
any longer to, to, to take away the domain name. But if you see something abnormal, inform us and we will do the same. And I think it's this way of, of working together uh, that also should happen at the more um, um, international um, level. That you say, okay, you have the diplomacy, you have the, the governments on the one side, uh, you have the, the other communities on the other side. We have to start listen to each other and start to understand each other. Uh, it's also, in a certain way, understand that the political process is something completely different and takes a lot more time. Uh, so I think the main thing at this moment is just let's uh, use the IGF to, to learn uh, from each other and don't try to fit in the big messages from the IGF into the, the uh, political process. I think because then we are, we are changing the IGF and, and lose a little bit of its strength. I think what you, what you mentioned is, is probably one of the key things of the IGF. It's not only about the outcomes. It's also about uh, learning how to communicate between professional cultures. And that was a big challenge. Those, those that were at the WSIS, and first time in Geneva and second time in Tunisia, could remember the way or the miscommunication, lack of communication between the government officials and diplomats on one hand and civil society or even business on the other hand because they were totally different professional cultures not really understanding each other. But is it improving with the IGF? What's your impression? Is it, do you have easier way of communication? Do, they, do you think they more understand policymakers, more kind of understand your concerns and your people, the technical community, more understands, understands better the, the political process? Well, one thing that, that's, uh, that's improving is that at least you know the people. And that, that can be even more important that, uh, that you know um, who to talk to and that who are the people that, that decide and who are the people that uh, are working in the political fora and so that you know who to, pro who to contact and that they know who they can, uh, they can contact. Uh, because I, my feeling is it's, it's still too early to say that uh, there is really an impact and they, they change what they are seeing, but at least, and I think we are already a, a big, big step further if that would happen, that they say, okay, before they decide at the political level, that they say, okay, let's, let's look to, to the people that are doing the job and that, have, that make the system working at this, this moment and try to, to contact them just to, to let them explain us. Um, and I think that's, or that's something that's already happening at this moment, thanks to, uh, to the IGF. But then w when it comes to the, the other processes and decisions that are being made, there are many other, right? And uh, Marvi, you mentioned uh, that, that you have been involved in a couple of other processes. Uh, what is the, is there any relation? I mean, we, we sometimes we get the impression that, that there are so many places where we can discuss internet governance and that they're not listening to each other. Is it, is it true? What's your input? period um, well of course uh, different organizations and different entities have their own topics of interest different UN organizations uh, discuss their own things of interest and uh, and sometimes they work in silos and that's one of one of the challenges but I think that the IGF is is really the place which brings all all uh, stakeholders and all organizations together. And it's like a glue which allows everybody to talk on everything, uh, on the large array of, of internet governance. And, uh, and I think we should value it as such. Um, but it's not a decision-making body, and, and that's for sure. Uh, we have, uh, I have been involved personally in, in uh, the UN uh, decision making on the follow up on WISIS, uh, which means uh, the Commission on Science and Technology, uh, which meets uh, every uh, May in its annual session and it uh, drafts a resolution for uh, the Economic and Social Council, which meets in, uh, in July. And, and that ends up to be uh, the UN resolution on WISIS uh, follow up. And in that process, we also have the message from IGF. I mean, IGF is on the agenda of, of the CSTD every May. And, and we get the, the uh, coordinator from the IGF to, to come and, and explain what happened in the last session, what were the, the key issues, and, and, and so on. And we hope that we can strengthen that link uh, in the future. 
so that uh, the main points from the uh, IGF would be sort of fed in better in the UN uh, decision-making system. So, um, yeah, it's quite a complex system, but I don't think that it's, it's totally isolated. There are links, and, and IGF really is in the heart of, of everything on Internet governance. But when you, when you involve the government, let's say the government's at the first level, but then the other stakeholders as well, do you have the impression, how many of government representatives do really understand the key issues of the, of the internet governance? How many of them do really get the principles how internet works and, and what can be done and what can't be done and what can be implemented on internet out of the common law that, that we know of policy and what cannot? Do you have the impression that they, not only governments and policy, uh, policy makers, but also other stakeholders still miss a little bit of understanding of holistic, having a holistic view of the whole picture? Yes, I think so. Uh, from my perspective, governments, as government representatives, we go to certain meetings. Somebody might follow the ITU, somebody might follow something else. And we don't always talk and exchange ideas. And even if we do, it's, it's incredibly difficult to have a holistic view on, on everything. Um, it's a challenge, but there are... Um, there are some people who follow everything, but not that many. And also it depends how, how long time you have been in the process. Of course, we welcome the newcomers, but we also value those who have been there long enough to experience, uh, to, 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 uh, to understand the holistic picture. Uh, we need everybody involved, certainly. Yeah, because uh, one of the examples that I usually hear when, for instance, the governments are working on cybersecurity strategy or something like that, not many of them always take into consideration the privacy side or the human rights side because it's cybersecurity, that's, that's our task, that's what we need to do. But this interlinks between a couple of different areas is, is sometimes missing. But I'm asking this because, and also Olga is involved in capacity building programs. Now, when you put them together, what is the best way to, to get them to understand each other, not only with regards to the topics, but also to understand better different professional cultures so they can better communicate at the IGF and in the other fora. Thank you, Vlada, and thank you for, for allowing me to, to be, uh, take this out. Uh, this is strange um, to talk. Um, s different things that I want to, to explain to set a little bit the scene. Um, I represent the government of Argentina, and I I'm also a university teacher. Being in different IGFs, we realized and it's not me, it's the statistics of the IGF that Latin America is the least represented region for different reasons, and we can talk a, a long time about it. It's not the point of this conversation. So we started to think that capacity building could bring more people into the IGF process, so let, let them know that there are ways to participate uh, and there are different issues that they should understand bef perhaps before they come and have a, a global picture, a holistic picture about different things. So we, we have designed a, a, a training program um, which is focused in Latin America but address the whole uh, different aspects of internet governance from this holistic perspective. So the program goes from infrastructure to privacy, security. It's a very informative program focused in Latin America but it has some specific, um, which I think interest a uh, characteristic. One is that we organize this training program in every country every year of the region. Why I say this? Because I am really afraid that the IGF is going every year more far away from Latin America. And I cannot tell why, because this is a government decision of, of big countries. We want it in Buenos Aires. We want we it in Buenos Aires. I mean, I want it in Buenos Aires. It's a lovely city. You will love it. Lovely food, lovely wine, lovely everything. But you know, next year, I think it will be in Indonesia. And this year, last year was in Kenya. And for Latin American people, traveling so far, it's expensive. It takes time. And it's always far away from home. So um, we don't know. We hope to change that in the future. So what we do is we rotate among countries because we think that there is value there. There's a lot of work involved, but it, there is value in going from one country to the other one. And I, I think that the, 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 the colleague from CCTLD said something very interesting. 
at least they know who, who's in charge of what. So the intention of the program is to give them uh, a, 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 an overview of all the holistic vision of the internet governance, going country by country, having more participation of that country in that year, but at the same time, let them know who is who from the CCTLD, from the national uh, um, authority of uh, the regulator, from the civil society participants, from the academy, um, and from the technical perspective, and from the RIR of the region, and all that. So the networking is also important. So when they come, they are not totally lost. And how they have to do to get a fellowship from ISOC, or if they can participate in an ISOC chapter, or if they can start an ISOC chapter, uh, so it's a high kind of a holistic uh, capacity building program. And, and this um, one example that I would like to share with you is the um, government of Colombia was interested in the program this year. We did it in March in, in Bogota. And they liked it. Uh, we usually have 50, 60 students that we pay everything but the ticket. Um, we pay accommodation, meals, and networking, and, and gala dinner and all that. Uh, with a limited budget, of course. Uh, but they said, this is very interesting. We want to bring people from all over Colombia. And we said, we don't have money for that. But they said, okay, we, we pay for that. So they brought one representative for every municipality of Colombia. They were 80 people added to the program. And uh, they were very interested. And uh, they knew about IGF, internet governance, and all that. And for the first time, Colombia has a GAC representative in ICANN which was a student from the school. So um, it's a process. I think that um, I, I, I'm afraid that Latin America is sometimes a little bit far away for, for several things. So this is our, our intention with this capacity building program. And uh, we have a workshop um, Thursday morning if you want to join and, and learn more. Uh, I think I talked too much, but. No, no, but I think it, it is relevant because one of the goals of this session is also to explain um, how each one of us can be further involved with the IG, not only IGF, but also the other, the other fora. Now we mentioned ICON, we mentioned the ITU one, where we didn't mention too much probably the Dubai meeting. And is it the end of the internet huh, in Dubai? No, yesterday Toure and, and Fadi Shehadi, they said they were friends. Did you see the, the, the high level yeah, minister? Yeah. <laughs> so you mean that was the end of the internet? <laughs> and they're friends, so it's yeah. starting. Well, it's a well fresh yeah. new start. I, I just want to confirm that, that even during the opening session, uh, uh, Ture explicitly said that, well, uh, ITU doesn't take decisions uh, unless it's on a consensual basis, and it is not uh, explicitly on the agenda. And Fadi at the end, uh, the CEO of the ICON, said at the end that, uh, uh, they will share the responsibilities uh, with the all the interested parties, so including ITU and uh, uh, as Olga mentioned, they seem to be the best friends. So, uh, but uh, more seriously, uh, it's n it, uh, we know well that they can influence things, but they, they haven't the final say. Uh, the conference itself, however, uh, uh, will tackle uh, other problems than the, the internet. I don't think this will be the major preoccupation of the of the this conference. Uh, it will uh, touch upon some issues related to internet. Uh, it's undeniable. However, as it was said, there will be a low key event uh, next year. This is the 2013. This is the World Telecommunication Policy Forum. Uh, which will strictly and exclusively concentrate on the internet itself. Uh, we can't really say what the future brings in, but it was a good sign also from Dr. Hamadin Toure when he said that this is also a multi-stakeholder approach. So it's an expert group and anyone can participate in this expert group. So uh, I, am, I am optimistic that this is not the end of the internet as we know it now. I think this is a good example of uh, the, the value of the IGF that it made it possible for the CEO of ICON and Secretary General of the ITU to sit down together, not only at the, ma at the, at the main session panel and say openly that they are not in war, well, at least they said so, but also to meet somewhere in the corridors and sit down and talk, which 
to also, I think, confirm. So this is, again, one other value of the IGF. Nicholas. And to, uh, to, to um, jump on, on the WTPF and on capacity building as well, I mean, these are very complex issues. I mean, the W, I mean, the, the, the ITRs, okay, it's an intergovernmental treaty, you know, it's a very formal outcome, but for example, the WTPF, it's a soft outcome in the sense that it's a try secretary try general. Try to explain every time when you, try to, try to explain every time when you mention the acronym or abbreviation. <laughs> There are so many of them. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, as uh, Peter said, next year in, in May is going to be a, a, a uh, World Telecom Policy Forum, which uh, will deal more directly on internet public policy issues. And um, I mean, what's important to understand is that even if the outcome of this WTPF will be only a Secretary General's uh, statement, I mean, these are this is text that will be reused at plenipotentiaries. I mean, this is a very complex environment and I, I, I think capacity building is very important. Internet govern government issues are, are multidimensional. I mean, um, uh, and one last example I wanted to give, uh, and again regarding the, the ITU, um, the ITU develops standards for telecommunications and we, we found out that many countries who participate in the ITU uh, standardization process are not necessarily aware that there is another body, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, which develops in a voluntary and open way the, the most important standards for, for the Internet, the DNS, the Internet Protocol. And realizing that we have started to have fellowships for people from West Africa, Latin America, and many other countries to participate in the ITF, to socialize with this very particular forum, but very important forum for standards development. So, I mean, internet governance is a, I guess it's, it's really a learning process. I mean, we are trying to learn to work with each other, different communities with our different expertise, and uh, that's definitely a process and, and we are not at the end of it. Uh, well, while you were talking, one thing that, that came to my mind is uh, one of the really important things that uh, I saw happening um, in the last seven years or seven uh, IGFs is what started to grow at the regional and, and local level. Um, first, you had the IGF in Athens, but then if you look every year, you had new uh, IGFs popping up here and there on the local, regional level, um, national level. And I think you can't uh, talk about uh, IGF and, and even you can't talk about the, the processes within ITU and, and, and whatever without um, recognizing how important those are. Uh, because if you, you look to your, if you look for example to a country, you will not, well the chances that you meet your representative who is the person pushing the, the, the voting uh, button at the ITU or in another, uh, the chances that you find them and you can motivate them here are much lower than the chances that you can have a silent chat with him at the national ITF or at your regional ITF. So I think those are, are really uh, also important to see uh, that as a, at the national regional level you have that same multi-stakeholder model involve the government and talk with your government on, on that level. Um, sometimes it will be on the same themes that are discussed here, on the same bis big projects, but on the other in other countries or in other regions, you will discuss other things because th they are more important um, for your country. So I think it's it's a little bit. Uh, I mean, you can't, you shouldn't think too much on the IGF. Like, okay, we have once a year um, that meeting, that big meeting where we all meet it each other, and then we send a message to the. Uh, um, to the uh, other processes. No, I think it's important that we also recognize that uh, sometimes the local and the regional level is, is as important. Peter. I, I fully agree whatever you said, except one. Uh, there's no voting in the ITU. Yeah. No one pushes any button. There are no buttons, in fact. Well, and, uh, it, it, even in the WRC 12, 
which was a very controversial conference. Uh, everything was accepted by consensus and by exhaustion. But uh, uh, that's a different story, but there is no war thing. Well, then I should rephrase myself and say uh, the one that uh, nods his head in yes or no. So <laughs> but, but thank you for, for mentioning the regional level. And I'm, I'm using the opportunity while Lee Hibbert from Council of Europe is here also to maybe hear why or how, how the regional level of discussion in the regional IGF, like the one we had in Europe, the Eurodic, and there are many others. There is an African one, there is a Latin America, Caribbean one, American one, Asia Pacific one. So there are many regional IGFs and now more and more national ones as well. Why is it relevant? Does it make an impact? Thank you very much. Um, I'll speak in the, uh, uh, as someone from Eurodig, not necessarily from the Council of Europe, but uh, uh, the Eurodig is the European Internet Governance Forum. Um, just a few things about that. Uh, it's had six, it's had five meetings so far since 2008, and it has its sixth meeting in Lisbon in June 2013. Um, it's grown, I would say, almost exponentially. Uh, we started with 100 people in Strasbourg, and it's moved to 600 people in Stockholm this June. Um, it's gone from a few sessions, a few plenary sessions and workshops to over 30 sessions uh, this June in, in Stockholm. A mixture of plenaries, lots of parallel workshops and flash sessions, short sessions allowing people a 30 minute window to talk with other people in the corner of a room or in a other room about something which is pa they're passionate about. So we're trying to create new uh, ways to talk to each other. Um, it's, I think it's pretty dynamic. It's uh, at the end of each Eurodig there are messages from, you know, from Stockholm, uh, from Belgrade, from Madrid. I mean, you know, this is a, a sort of an outcomes document, which is sort of rough consensus. It's not conclusions. It's not agreed. Uh, we have reporters, etc., and and it, it just gives a, a spotlight on the on some of the things which were said. So it's you know it, there might be disagreement, and the disagreement will be will be reflected in the document, of course. Um, but it's there, it's there as a record, and I think that's quite useful. Uh, it's quite dynamic. I think I, I, I had the feeling pe people really like it. I I'm, I'm biased. I'm, I'm involved in the process a lot, all year round. It's not just an event, it's a process. It's like the IGF. It's not just an event, it's a process and an, uh, and an event. And you need, the, you need both. You need the process to come together and to, to exchange, but you need to see each other physically and to connect. People need to meet face to face so you break down these borders, these barriers, if there are barriers. And, and like you're saying about the ITU and, and the ICANN uh, gentlemen, I mean, they, they, you know, they're, they're meeting face to face, they're talking. It, that's, it's about sitting in a room together and, and breaking down those barriers. That, that's why IGOs, international governmental organizations, came about after the Second World War, was to try to create um, you know, people talking, dialogue over, over fighting. Um, and I think it's just, it's very, it's, it's very useful. You see it, you're here. You see the utility of talking to each other, meeting and talking freely, more and more freely. Um, you can't really quantify it. It's a bit like human rights and things like that. It's very difficult to, s to measure the success of a discussion between you and me. Is the, is how do you measure that success? It's, it's, it's just very difficult. So you have a good feeling or not, but you know, it's, it's just not easy to, to tell people who are not here why it's important. So that's a struggle for me at the Council of Europe with human rights. It's a struggle for me in Eurodig, or it's a struggle for us in IGF to explain to people back home why it's important to talk to each other. Um, you know, uh, it sh I, I think the fact the facts are that it's it's now into its sixth year. The fact that um, you have uh, it's growing in numbers, so we've really re reached uh, I think maximum capacity over two two days or a day and a half to have over 30 events uh, with 600 people or so with remote participation. It's it's you know we are really stretching ourselves over over a short period of time, but people are, are enjoying it. You can see uh, we're having the national IGFs. There's about 16 or so in Europe in the pan-European space who are, are coming more and more together. So there's more and more work and support from the Council of Europe Commission, the European Commission, and Eurodig together to try to join the dots between the national, the local discussions, and the European discussions and the global discussions. So it's coming, and so we're all taking part in different national discussions. Next week, I'm going to the first first Norwegian IGF. Uh, a colleague of mine is going to the first Bulgarian IGF. 
Uh, I'm speaking to someone who wants to set up a, the first Hungarian IGF. I mean, it seems to be just growing and growing and growing. So, ah, there you are. So, um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very exciting. And, and, and you, you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why are people creating these dialogues? Because people want to talk. Perhaps there's no means to talk about these things otherwise than these spaces. So they're, they're also trendy. Um, and, and I think at the moment they're, they're, they're really working. So we shouldn't underestimate this dialogue, although it's difficult to measure um, and to quantify. Uh, one final point, which is with Eurodig, for example, is that, and I think it applies to the IGF, you've still got to make it interesting for people, particularly new people, why it's important to explain this. These sort of sessions are very important. Um, we try very hard to, to make keep it dynamic and fresh. Um, I'd like to see more new blood uh, in these sessions and, and in and other sessions. It shouldn't be the same faces. We should step aside and let others talk, bring do, do our own capacity building at home uh, and, and, and do that. That's, that's something I think we should try to improve. And my last point is, is that um, um, in the Eurodig, we're trying to, uh, we, you know, you know, whole, all year round it's a process and an event. And you know, we're trying to avoid get, getting captured by processes and people proposing things. We want really trying to go towards a new process this year with t in 2013, sticking to a call for proposals for issues, content, challenges, tensions, conflicts, and, and focusing immediately on, on what are those conflicts, what are, what are those challenges? And then reverse engineering it a bit and saying, well, who's involved in that tension? If it's, if it's you know, an example, like if it's the ITU and, and ICANN that you just mentioned, then they should be in the room. And we should be talking about those things together. If we don't find the quorum of people who really matter for a particular topic, then we should drop the session. That's my opinion. And, and I think we have to try to get more point-to-point -point discussion we should avoid having <coughs> questions and then are people asking other questions and not answering the, the first question. And so there's a lot of dialogue where, where we're, we're missing each other. We're not, we're not touching points. So I, I think you need to do more point-to-point uh, -point discussions and, and meeting of people. Uh, and, and, you know, if you don't get that, if you don't get that quorum and that connectivity, then I'd be inclined to say we don't do that. And we leave space for other things where we can get that, um, those people and those points to develop. Thanks, Lee. I think one of the important aspects was exactly uh, the, the, the fact that we, we can't measure it, but it's about the communications and so on, and that the IGF is basically not the two events. It's what happens between the two events and uh, throughout the year, also in the online space and so on. Uh, I We have some maybe 10 more minutes, even less. Any questions from your side? Any comments that you want to jump in with? Anyone? Or should we leave to the to the panelists for the last round of short comments? Uh, what are your suggestions for all of us? How do we get involved or stay involved with the IG process? Not only IGF, but the IG processes, whatever they are, the ITU, the ICANN, the IGF, any other. How do we do that? What would you suggest? Couple of words, starting from Olga. Thank you, Vlada. I think that we have to develop a little bit of going out of the silo. Th it's difficult because each of us, kn we, we know something. I mean, I'm an expert in, in infrastructure and it's difficult for me to understand um, the, the, the privacy issue and the security, but um, infrastructure is, is relevant for other issues. So we have to try to think about out of the box a little bit and try to understand other aspects of internet governance and that's very challenging because each of us we have one area of expertise it's difficult to be a, a high expert uh, on, on many many things um, we usually are not so that's challenging and try to use the IGF and national IGF and regional IGF to interact with those experts of other areas and then try to build from there in the case that infrastructure becomes relevant for security or becomes relevant for privacy or becomes relevant for uh, inclusion through accessibility, for example. We have to try to look to the sides and, and make those relationships. I think this is the best place to do that. Well, since it's a newcomer session, I my advice is uh, what I said in the first part, don't be shy, 
to ask, don't be shy to go to the person you are interested in and ask questions and engage in discussions, even though your knowledge may mainly be on the same level. But that is the way to improve your knowledge, and that is the improve to improve your uh, understanding of the RG issues. And then you can decide it for yourself how you would like to go about it. Thank you. Mary. I'm going to give some practical um, suggestions. Find out who coordinates a World Summit of the Information Society in your administration. It should be either Ministry for Foreign Affairs or uh, Telecommunications. Uh, there is a person who does that. Ask if there is a national uh, WISIS uh, working group or, or nat national IGF, uh, something like that. Uh, if you are interested in one particular meeting, such as, for example, the Wicked uh, in Dubai, ask from your administration who coordinates that uh, and the preparations uh, from your national side and ask how to get involved. You can also contact the organization, in this case the ITU, and ask how you can be involved. Many national uh, coordinators accept uh, other non-governmental uh, actors in their national delegations. So if you represent an organization, civil society or business, you might be able to uh, even participate in, in that way. Or maybe the ITU makes an exception. Uh, they have announced that they, they, uh, they can do that as well. And, and you may be able to participate. I'm not promising any funding <laughs> for participation, but at least uh, uh, I think the best thing is, uh, as Peter said, not to be shy and uh, just knock the doors. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I think one of the, the key takeaway from me, um, I mean, obviously the IGF is this place where all stakeholders come together, but I think it's really important that different stakeholders participate more in each other's processes. I want to see more civil society people see what the IETF is about. I want to see more technical people go to the Human Rights Council on what human rights discussions are about. So uh, I think there are many progresses there and that we can go, go much further. The second and last point, which I think is, is very important as part of the IG process, and to echo so some comments that uh, we've heard is the, the importance to share best practices. Uh, because, you know, I think there are a lot of discussions on principles, values, and, you know, it can get qui very quickly emotional and divide people. But I think that best practices uh, is very important. And, and, and I think that the, the emergence of local and regional IGFs reflects the fact that there is a need for relevant uh, discussions. Um, so this would be my, my advice. Okay. I think by now everything has been <laughs> said, so uh, I can only repeat. So uh, I, th I think the two things that are that's most, uh, most relevant or most important is here, but also at home, try to, to learn uh, what others are doing and try to explain what you are doing rather than come here with an agenda and try to convince the other that you're right, uh, say, okay, you have a completely different opinion, why? And, and that's the first step. And the second one, uh, I repeat myself, it's uh, the importance of, of doing the same thing, discussing internet, discussing internet governance, also at home, and at home go and see who are the other relevant stakeholders and, and see um, and discuss with them over there. And uh, tweet and vlog and uh, share the information that you find and keep your voice up. And probably that's the best recommendation that you could hear on what to do next. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to all of you for sitting here till the end. And now I think we go for gala dinner. <laughs>